Hi, I'm back. Um, I just wanted to go through triage and we're going to talk about ESI versus MCI triage. So ESI is what we do every day, all day, sorting patients according to the severity of illness and injury. So the most severe uh, are treated first and the ESI acuity level fives are those patients that probably can wait several days to be seen uh, either here or at their primary care. MCI training or MCI triage, you do the most good for the most number of patients. So it's kind of a brutal way of, of triaging to some extent, um, but uh, it, it, because MCI incidents, our resource, our, our demand will outpace our resources, we have a limited number of resources, so we have to do the most good for the most number of patients. All right, so I'm not going to talk too much about ESI because this is what we do every day. Um, so emergency severity index is ESI, acuity, acuity levels one through five. Acuity level one, of course, is life or limb. The patient has to be seen immediately on down to acuity level five when they can wait uh, and probably wait several days to be seen. And uh, acuity level three, four, and five are based on the number of resources that that patient is going to need. Uh, one and two are not based on resources. They're just based on, um, on how quickly these patients need to be seen and treated. So we're, they tri are triaged by level of severity. So our category, our acuity level one, would be seen before our acuity level five, obviously. Um, so, all right, moving on to guiding principle of disaster triage. Do the most good for the most number of patients. All right, so MCI triage. So like I said in the previous video, primary triage generally is done in the field. We most likely will never do primary triage here at Children's unless there's like, like I said in the previous video, unless there's like a bombing or a chemical release locally where people are showing up in cars, they're showing up by foot. Um, but most likely we would be doing triage as we usually do until we are told by our ED leadership or the incident commander to set up the MCI triage. So 99.999% of the time we are gonna be doing ESI triage, but I wanted to uh, at least teach you how to do MCI triage just in case that opportunity um, comes about that we have to. So primary triage is done in the field. It's a very quick triage. They basically give the patient a color um, and then they move on. So it's like 30 seconds per patient. Secondary triage is just before they're, uh, they're transported to the hospital. So this is when we get the ring downs from the field. This is when we're getting that MCI alert from, um, from ReadyNet. And then our third level of triage is at the hospital. So when they arrive, we would be doing our ESI triage. So with disaster triage, the acuity levels are green, yellow, red, and black. So green is minor, basically the walking wounded. These are patients that are, um, are minimally, very minor injuries and they can, they're unlikely to deteriorate over the next several days. Um, generally, when you have this type of situation, you would set up these tarps that you see in uh, the picture, and somebody would, would uh, say, if anyone can hear my voice, please follow me or come over to the green tarp. I think we have green flags, so we would just say, you know, can you come over to the green flag? Yellow is delayed, so victims need to be transported in a timely manner, but that can be delayed because they, they may have serious injuries, but they're stable at the moment. That being said, we need to continuously reassess these patients to make sure that these patients are not getting worse. Red is immediately immediate, so victims can be helped by immediate intervention and transport. So these would be the patients that would be transported first to, to hospitals. They need to be seen generally within 60 minutes and uh, includes compromises to patients with airway, breathing, and circulation. 
Black is for those victims that are unlike to, unlikely to survive their injuries. Um, so they are provided with palliative care um, and pain relief. Okay, oops, sorry. So basic principles of primary triage, it's 30 seconds per patient. Okay, this is the first level of triage out in the field most likely. So you spend this, the primary triage nurse would do 30 seconds per patient. All they do would be to see if there's any airway maneuver that would help or uh, uh, hemorrhaging that needs to be stopped. Otherwise you stop evaluating once you have determined the patient's category. Okay, and we're gonna go through how you triage a patient. So there's minimal treatment during the primary triage. This nurse de designates them as yellow, red, green, and then they, someone else will place the tag and then they move on to the next patient. And then there's people behind them that will come and either transport or provide care in the field. We have disaster tags, triage tags, which are in the equipment room in a bin. These are ours, they are pediatric. Um, so they have these uh, armbands that you would put one around the patient, one around the parent. They have the same number, same number so that they can be brought together. And also any evidence or contaminated clothing, you would put this in the bag with it. This is the triage tag and you would rip off, say they were a uh, immediate, you would rip off minor and delayed and what would be left would be immediate. You would place the tag around the patient's neck um, and then um, they would just be uh, further you would, they would go to their secondary triage at that point, okay? All right, so the two types of MCI or mass casualty uh, triage, we have start adult triage and jump start pediatric multiple casualty incident triage. So adult triage starts about at eight to 10 years of age. Uh, jump start is for anyone under the age of eight. And we're going to go through each of them. Okay, so jump start. If you can remember A, P, M for either jump start or start. Respiratory, pulse, mentation. Okay, so it's appropriate for patients under the age of eight to 10 ish, depending on the size of the patient. So let's go through it. All right, so in jump start, are they able to walk? If they are able to walk, they're the walking wounded, they're minor, then they go to secondary triage. If they are not able to walk, then you move on to R, or respiratory, or you don't move on, you start R, which is respiratories. Are they spontaneously breathing? No. What would you do? You would reposition the airway. If they spontaneously breathe at that point, they're immediate. If uh, they continue to be apneic, then you want to check their pulse. Do they have a pulse? If it's no, they are expected, expectant, they're not likely to survive. If they do have a palpable pulse, but they're apneic, you want to give them five rescue breaths. And this is the main difference between START, which is the adult, and the jump start, which is the pediatric. With START, you do not give five rescue breaths. In jump start, you do. Now, do you have to remember that? I would just remember jump start. If you give five rescue breaths to an adult, is it gonna hurt? No. Um, so just, just remember um, uh, five rescue breaths if it's jump start and you don't have to do it with adults, but no harm, no foul. If they continue to be apneic after five rescue breaths, then they're expectant. They're provided with comfort and palliative care. If they do spontaneous, spontaneously breathe, then they are deemed an immediate patient. They should be transported to the hospital. All right, so if they are spontaneously breathing, then you look at their respiratory rate. If it's less than 15 or greater than 45, then they would be taken immediately for evaluation in a hospital. Uh, if they're between 15 and 45, which is normal for a pediatric patient, then you would go on to P. So now we've done R, now we're to P palpable pulse. If no, they go immediate. Now, you may not be able to feel that palpable pulse because they may be in shock. Um, 
So, but if they are breathing, they uh, most likely have blood circulating, but they, you may not feel the pulse. If they do have a palpable pulse, then you move on to neurologic or M, mentation. All right, so if your patient is breathing, they have a pulse. Okay, are they responding to you appropriately? Um, a, if they're alert, verbal, or an appropriate P, which would be withdrawing from pain, then they would be delayed. If they don't have an appropriate P, which would be posturing like decerebrate, decorticate, they're not responding to pain, or if they're unresponsive, they would be immediate. Okay? So we're going to go through some scenarios in a few minutes. Okay, so start. Again, the main difference between start and jump start is the, um, the rescue breaths. So are they walking? Yes, they're minor. Are they breathing? If not, you position the airway. If they're apneic, they're expectant. If they spontaneously breathe, that's immediate. Is their respiratory rate greater than 30? Then they're immediate. If they're less than 30, you go on to perfusion. Do they have a radial pulse? If it's absent, they're immediate. If they do and their cap fill is less than two seconds, you go on to mentation. If they obey commands, they're delayed. If they uh, don't uh, obey commands, they would be immediate. Okay, so now we're going to, um, let me move this. I can, and I can't, or can I? Yes, I can. I move this for a second so you can see it. All right, um, so we have a six-year-old, MCI, multiple, school bus collision, wandering around confused and asking questions repetitively, has a positive deformity to the left forearm and a large laceration to the left parietal area. Their respiratory rate is 20, their pulse is 105. What triage designation would you give this patient? Well, let's uh, ask some questions. Okay, hang on, this is not working. All right. Hmm. All right. Was is he able to walk? Yes. So he's minor. If you look up at the the uh, jump start, able to walk? Yes, they're minor. Now that being said, you want to make sure that you're reassessing this patient uh, to make sure that they're they are not decompensating. Okay. Scenario two. An unconscious eight-year-old found on the side of the road from the same multi-vehicle pileup, apneic with weak peripheral pulses at a rate of 65. Okay, what triage designation would you give this patient? Okay, let's ask the questions. Are they able to walk? Well, he's found on the side of the road unresponsive, so no. Is he breathing? Yes, he's got a rate of, six, uh, oh, a pulse rate of 65. No, he's not, he's apneic. What do you do next? You put reposition because he's apneic. He continues apneic after repositioning. Now this is an eight-year-old, we're using jump start. So what do you do? Does he have a pulse? You check for a pulse. If he has no pulse, they're expectant. But he does have a pulse. So he has a palpable pulse, so get five rescue breaths. If then uh, has spontaneous breathing, what would happen? He would be immediately transported, okay? The last scenario. So we have a 10 year old found on the side of the road from same multiple vehicle pileup, arousable with verbal cues, but then goes right back to sleep. Respiratory rate of 20, pulse of 95. What triage designation would you give this patient? Okay, so is he able to walk? No. Is he breathing? He has a respiratory rate of 20. Does he have a pulse? Pulse of 95, which is pretty normal for that. A little on the low side, but what is his mental status? Um, he's arousable with verbal cues, but then he goes right back to sleep. So what triage level would you make him? Delayed, okay? That being said again, you wanna reassess this patient to make sure that they're not decompensating. And if they decompensate, then you can make them a red, they can be immediately transported. And we're gonna go through more scenarios in skills day. So um, 
I would recommend that you go to that website uh, that I, I indicated in the first um, video or first PowerPoint, because um, it's kind of fun to do the, the triage, the disaster triage. It's a game. Okay, so summer, in summary, business as usual until we're directed to do otherwise by the ED manager or incident command. So always, always, always ESI triage only until we are told by ED management or leadership and or incident command that we are moving into a disaster triage. You wanna prioritize your care based on level of acuity. Communication with the nursing supervisor incident command is imperative to know what's happening in the rest of the hospital. Um, and also what resources are available to us. The charge nurse assists with flow and assignments. Then if at all possible, the charge nurse should not be taking an assignment because they are the ones that know the most about what's going on in general on the unit. So the charge nurse would be working with the attendings to figure out how to best um, figure this out. So we would wanna utilize our resources, our PICU staff, our PACU staff, any staff that formerly worked in the ED. We call a pharmacy stat, policies and procedures. We wanna look at the emergency trauma icon and the emergency disaster icon to go through, um, to go through uh, the, the different policies and procedures. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, but again, we will be in, in skills day, I'll go through different scenarios so we can have more of a discussion. All right. Well, thank you.